Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to the Pivot Point study today. My name is Scotty Killingsworth. I get to be the pastor of the Sauk River Cowboy Church there in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, we are studying the uh, a, a, a document I wrote, a, a, a work st a study book I wrote called Pivot Points, <clears throat> and we've been dealing with that today. We're in the 10th session, I hope you've got to follow along with us. We'll be looking primarily at the book of Revelation today and uh, pivot point number seven. Now, what we're going to deal with today is uh, we're going to look at the two witnesses from the book of, of Revelation, chapter 11. Who are they? What are they? What's it all about? How, we, how can we understand this? Uh, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Now, first of all, we have to remember that God was speaking through an angel to this old man John on the Isle of Patmos. He gave him this vision, and this and he, this angel spoke to him. And now, this vision that John had from this angel, or from God Himself through the angel, was both literal and figurative. Uh, there were images in it, and there's language in it that uh, are, are are both to be taken. And literally, and then some to be taken figuratively. Now, the lack of clarity here. There is, in this in this study about the two witnesses, this is really opaque. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's it's kind of the big word is obfuscated. God dis, just doesn't hide or doesn't come out and tell us really clearly here what's going on. We have to try to figure some stuff out. But no, oh no, I want you to notice this. I believe it's on purpose, this uh, uh, lack of clarity. I think God didn't, I mean, he could have, he could have just written it out, but he wanted us to dig, to pray, to think, uh, and, and for his reasons, and I, I don't know why all either, but that's what I, I'm, I'm going to say. Now, prior to this vision, Jesus had interpreted John's visions uh, as we study through the book of Revelation and, and others. The, the visions were always interpreted. Jesus would tell him, what, what he meant by it, but not this time. There is no explanation. Nobody steps up and says, well, this is what that means, or this is how that goes. Nobody does that. Uh, to John and, to, uh, and us today, we got to figure it out. So that's what we're going to try to do. What they mean, what are, where are, what are they, what's going on. Those are some things that we're going to try to figure out here. Now, John the Baptist, do you remember him back in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels? He came, and the Bible says, he came in the spirit of Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Now, what does that mean? Well, it wasn't a reincarnation. It wasn't, it wasn't Elijah again. It was that John the Baptist had uh, the temperament, the passion, the, uh, the purpose uh, of, uh, that, that Elijah had. And so... The Bible says that he came, that he, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Now, these two witnesses today, they are different because they do not come in anybody's spirit. They don't come in in the spirit of somebody. They are they just show up and they. The Bible is lets us know this is a literal interpretation. This is not figurative. This is to be taken literally. Apparently, these witnesses were originally human and they show up without birth information or lineage we just don't know much about them they just pop on the scene and here they are and so here we have to deal with it now let's start thinking and digging into this a little bit and to do so i want to turn i want you to go to hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 and i want to read this for you just as people are destined to die once and after that, to face judgment, so Christ was sancti sorry, sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, let me go back and say that again. Just as people are destined to die once. In other words, the King James says, it is appointed unto man once to die. So what we're saying here is, what the Bible is saying is, everybody dies. So, if these witnesses are going to show up, here in the last days in the book of Revelation chapter 11, if they're going to show up and uh, they're going to be somebody and probably somebody from the, the Old Testament, we, we, we've kind of figured that out. They've got to be somebody, well, at least from the Bible. They've got, they probably will be somebody. So what we've got to do is we need to start looking for somebody that didn't die. 
So let's go back in the Bible and look for some people who, who didn't die. And I know that if you've never read the Bible or heard this taught before, that may sound a little odd for you. But there were some people that had some strange death experiences. Okay, let's, t let's start talking with Lazarus. Jesus, I'm sorry, Lazarus died, if you'll remember the story, and uh, while they were waiting for Jesus to come, and uh, he died. And he'd been dead four days before Jesus got there. But when Jesus got to, the, to, to Bethany where he lived, he raised him from the dead. He said, Lazarus, come for us. And Lazarus came out of the grave. Now, he died there. Jesus raised him back to life. But we just have always assumed, the Bible doesn't say, but it never mentions any of the fact that Lazarus died later again. Now, we don't know that, but we presume that he did. There's just nothing said. So, he's, he is a questionable candidate at best, but I wanted to throw him out there and, and let you rank him as a possibility that Lazarus may be, uh, there's something weird about his death, and maybe he's going to be one of them. I don't think so, but that's I wanted to put him in the running. Now, the next guy I want to introduce to you is called Enoch. And Enoch we find in Genesis 5 uh, and other places, but especially Genesis 5. And I want to read that uh, from my uh, manual here. In Genesis 5, on page 54, Genesis 5, 18, it says, When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, here it is now, Enoch walked with God faithfully 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. And here it is, verse 24. Enoch walked faithfully with God and he was no more because God took him away. All right, so most Bible scholars believe that God took Elijah to heaven in a rapture-type experience before he died, and that he didn't die. But because Hebrews 9.27 tells us it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment, then we've got a, we've got a little problem. Well, what, we, what we're saying here is that this just, to me, makes Enoch one of the candidates for the witnesses. Because he didn't die, but the Bible says he will die. We know the witnesses die, so I don't know. It makes sense to me. Uh, so let's let's put put on your list uh, Lazarus, which I don't think is is one, and then Enoch, which really to me makes sense. And then the third one I want to talk about is Elijah. In two Kings two, uh, we read uh, they tell us about a very unusual event following uh, involving Elijah. But what happened was Elijah was an amazing prophet, did all kinds of miracles and preached. And but anyway, when he got when it came when it came to the end of his earthly life, a, a chariot, the Bible calls it, or a, a vehicle. If you want to do that, if you want to think about that, a, a vehicle swoops down from heaven and takes him away. Elijah and I laughingly say Elijah was abducted by an alien spacecraft. Well, he, he was, but. I'm not, it's not like the modern alien things we talk about today, or maybe it is, but, but the point is, I just say that for, for a laugh, but he was taken away, so he didn't die. Hebrews 27, 9, 27 says, he will die, so candidate number two. So here, we could stop right now because we've got two legitimate candidates for the witnesses in, in Revelation, but uh, let's, let's go on. I think there, there are some others that we want to look at. I want to read Malachi chapter 4, and this is um, uh, Malachi chapter 4, and it says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth once. So this prophecy, I think, Malachi's prophecy and other places has completely fulfilled, for my for my satisfaction, that one of the two candidates is Elijah. So we've got two possible candidates now. 
one questionable and one and two bingo right on uh, but is there another and I think there might be something else so I want to bring that out to I and just for your consideration what about Moses is what I'm saying well there is some question about Moses his death again has to do with his death there is just some uh, odd things there some 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 things that make us scratch our head and say what because uh, when Moses died, if you'll remember, uh, he was on Mount Pisgah. He was looking over into the Promised Land. He was not allowed to come into the Promised Land, but he was looking over into the Promised Land. And uh, while he was doing that, he, he died. But, uh, but then the devil, or the, the devil came and fought with, with an angel over his body. Uh, Michael, he fought with Michael over... Moses' body. Now, what is that all about? Why did did the angel want? Why did the devil want Moses' body? Why did God not want the devil to have Moses' body? Well, that'll set you off on another trail of, of thought. But uh, we're not going to deal with that. But maybe it makes you think Moses might be a candidate just because of that obscurity and weirdness there about uh, his death. Okay, so let's let's summarize here. We have Lazarus, we have Enoch, we have Elijah, and we possibly have Moses. So we got the four. Uh, what if these, but then there's another thought. I want to bring this for your thought too. What if these witnesses are not actual men? I know, don't run away throwing your hat in the air, in the air but just think for a moment. What if they're not men? What if they're institutions? And that God is speaking figuratively to us and not literally. I don't think he is, but what would it be like if he was? What if the two witnesses were, and some people say they're the Old and the New Testament? Those are the witnesses. And wow, that makes good sense, doesn't it? Here, you know, we've had the Old Testament, we've got the New Testament, and they've been here all the time and preaching and teaching. It just makes sense. So let's let's go back and reread uh, Revelation 11 just, just a little bit and see if we can get any more understanding here. And here it says in Revelation 11, we're in the last part of verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Okay. Olive trees, lampstands, figurative. He says these are... This, this is figurative. He's not saying they're actual lampstands and olive trees. He said they're, it's figurative. They're like these two. So the olive tree is symbolic of the Jewish people. Olive tree iconology is all over ancient Jewish artifacts and literature. It's just it's everywhere. The olive tree represents the Jewish people. Uh, so we've got first then, if we had one witness, if we're going to follow this train of thought, one witness would be the olive tree Israel. Okay, we got it. Now, Israel, limbs broken off, weakened from age. Yeah, but still an olive tree. So, the second olive tree, who could that be? What if it's the church? What if you have ancient Judaism, especially those Jewish people who what we today would call Messianic, those Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah? What if it's they who, who, who are the true Israel. And the second olive tree is the true church, not the Christians in name only, but the truly born-again, spirit-filled believers. What if that is the second witness, the Gentile church? So we could, we've got the Messianic Jews who've always, who've always believed in Messiah and, and, and those who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And then we've got the Gentile church. Spirit filled, born again. We've got those two. Those could be, they make sense to me for the two witnesses. Uh, so let's play the what if game just a little bit and kind of run down that road. If this is what Revelation 11 is telling us, then we we can figure some things out about God. We can learn some theology, some real theology here about him. And, uh, and uh, that's what I always want to do, find out more about God. Here's what we learn. First of all, we learn he's, he still loves his people, the Jews. He loves them. And don't you ever forget that. God loves them. The Jewish people are 
are, are co-equal partners. Sorry, they're, they're, those, they play a major role in the final drama of tribulation and what follows. They walk, they did, some walked away from God, but God never left them. In other words, don't discount the Jews. I mean, we're going to see, I believe, a great outpouring of a rebirth of Judaism, Messianic Judaism, where truly born-again people will come in these last days. But what if that's one of the witnesses, and that's the born-again Jews, and the other, of course, would be the church. But let me say that the church is not a replacement for the Jewish people. Now, there is today, there are some who believe in replacement theology, and they say, they teach that the church, Jesus gave up, God gave up on the church, and so he, had, oh, I'm sorry, God gave up on Judaism, so he just adapted and went to the church. And so I, I don't think that's accurate. God did not give up on Judaism. And God did adopt and, and went with your, or the church, but he didn't do away with one. He brought both, two, two witnesses into the world. Okay, so the lampstand analogy speaks of two groups that shine the light of truth into the dark world. Boy, that's what they both did. Those two trees, the olive tree, uh, which is the, the ancient Judeans, or G Messianic Jews and the Gentile ch Christians, they feed and nourish the world like the olive tree. They, they shine light, so you get it. So Abraham's people shine the light into the Old Testament world. The Gentile shine, shines the light into the, the last 2,000 years of the church age. Okay. Now those, those are, I've given you three possibilities today. Uh, the literal men, the, the Old and New Testament, Judaism and Christianity. And, and so those are, and, and, and may not, there have been many books written about all, any of those three you want to pick out. But then let's talk about some of the problems that come up with a figurative interpretation. Here's the problem. The two witnesses die, if you read the story there in Revelation, and they lay in the streets of Jerusalem. Okay, how does that work? How does that, how, the Old and New Testament dies and all, Judaism and, and Gentile church, well, I've got some problems there. But since we're speaking figuratively and not so literally at this point, you can see how some could, could make the case that that is what's going to happen. What if the Jews had a rebirth of power about halfway through the tribulation and accepted Jesus as a whole nation? And, and what if the entire church, the New Testament church, in the book of Revelation, in the tribulation, Became a, had another Pentecost, another spirit filling. You know, things you, you could you could you could make a case for that. I just think, wouldn't the world mind be blown? Those people that are devil inspired, demon possessed, who were wanting to uh, to uh, abort babies and promote it politically and and deal uh, with all those ungodly issues that we talk about so much, wouldn't it blow their minds if? The church caught on fire, and the Messianic Jews got a vision of who Jesus really is. Man, they would turn this world around, wouldn't they? I want to go to Revelation chapter 11 uh, here for just a moment and, uh, and, and read again. Did the, uh, <clears throat> because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious, but... If their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full, full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the, in the hope, by the way, this is Romans 11, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world what will their acceptance be but life from the dead and if if the, the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy then the whole batch is holy if the roots are holy so are the branches if some of the branches have been broken off and though you have uh, though you are wild are a wild olive shoot as and have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. And you can read on and on there about that. I just get excited about thinking about the possibility here of being part of a second Pentecost, of being on the earth in mid-tribulation, which I think this fits there. And we watch when, when the Holy Spirit 
in, empowers that troubled church again. And, and we do things like they did in the second chapter of Acts. We speak in languages we've not learned, and we call fire down from heaven. We preach with power and fire, and we watch thousands of people, if not millions of people, come to faith in Jesus. Uh, during those days, those witnesses, as we know, they can stop the rain, turn water to blood, cause plagues. Hey, I want some of that. Sign me up. I'd like to do that. So when these two witnesses die, the world rejoices. And, and quite honestly, don't you think that, that the rejoicing of the world, we can see how that could even be beginning now? Because there are people who hate the church. They, they hate what we stand for and what we, uh, because they think we're trying to keep them from enjoying their life. We're trying to make them feel guilty. And of course we're not. We, we, simp we love people. We love sinners. We love them. The, Jesus loved them. The church loves them. And, but we cannot agree and say what they're doing is right. We love them, but, but they're sinning. And uh, but that, they don't like that. And so when the, when the church is out of the way, there's going to be rejoicing, just like we read about here in, in the book of Revelation. They're going to, the, the lost world can echo all, destroy all the echoes of religion and give it their full allegiance to the beast. And these two witnesses, when they're out of the way, the world is going to party, party hardy. Now, just imagine how the party's going on. I mean, all over the world, the sinners, the lost people, those that didn't believe in Jesus, never believed there was a God, they're partying like there's no tomorrow. And the, the cameras are rolling in Jerusalem on these two witnesses, if they're men, and I think they are, on these two men laying dead in the streets of Jerusalem. And the camera's watching them. They're dead. Party on, dude. Party on. But something crazy is about to happen, which is going to stop the party all over the planet. And you know what it is? The two witnesses who have been killed are going to come back to life. They're going to stand up. They're going to get up. They're going to start breathing again. Whatever, was, whatever happened to them that killed them, it's been, it's been fixed, and they're going to be resurrected and come back. And, uh, wow, it's going to be crazy. I'm going to turn now in my, in my study guide. I'm going to read this to you from uh, the book of Revelation 11.11. 11. Now after the three and a half days, that's how long they've been dead. Now after the three and a half days, the breath from God, of God entered, then entered into them, and they stood on their feet. And great fear fell on all who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. And the same hour, at, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake. And a tenth of the city fell. That would be Jerusalem. The, in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. And the rest were afraid and gave, God, gave glory to the God of heaven. Wow, okay. There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen that it's kind of neat, isn't it? Okay, so we got Enoch and Elijah laying dead on the streets of Jerusalem and they come back to life. Uh, the beast killed them. The beast, we'll talk about that next week, who the beast is. The beast killed them and everybody partied and now they're back. And uh, folks, it's going to scare the living spit out of the demon-inspired hellish remains on earth. Who's those people? that are here, that are running things, uh, who are d devilish and godless, they're going to be scared to death. And the saved saints, those on the earth, those that are here at that time, are going to be raptured, they're going to be translated, and going to be caught up into heaven. And, uh, and that's what I think is, we call a mid-trib rapture. And that's where I lean toward, uh, in my own personal theology. I, wherever you pick out... It's fine. We're not going to fight over that, but because th th I just think that's where it's going to fit. Now let's go on because this it just gets crazier. After the two rep the witnesses are they die they come back to life, they, and they're raptured and then there is a rapture of all the living saints, every born again Gentile Christian, every Messianic Jew. They're translated and they move up. To, the, to meet the Lord in the air. And then 
the next event is what we're going to deal with a whole lot in pivot point number nine, but I'm going to give you a little, little taste of it here. At that very moment, a great earthquake shakes the earth. And, and I believe, uh, more accurately, it could be referred to as a pole shift. Now, I'll explain that a whole lot more in the next, in our next meeting. But as you know, our, the, our North Pole, there's a magnetic and there's an actual uh, pole. The magnetic North Pole drifts and it moves in different directions. It's been in several different places over the millennia, over the thousands of years. Right now, it is moving toward uh, Siberia, we're told. Not that that matters. But what I think is going to happen, and we'll talk about this a whole lot more in, in the next pivot point, something is going to pass through our solar system between us and the orbit of the sun. It's going to pass through the inner, the inner, or, inner planets, and it's going to be so gravitationally heavy that it will disrupt uh, the uh, planets. It'll disrupt the rotation of planets. Uh, it will literally cause a, a polar shift where that North Pole will slide back quickly to its original North Pole position. The, the uh, electronic or the, the uh, magnetic North Pole will slide right back to the, uh, to the Polish, the pole that goes through the, the, the imaginary pole that goes through the middle of the Earth. Now, when that happens, uh, we're going to see uh, an, an, an asteroid bombardment of the Earth. Because when that passes through the Earth, uh, we're going to see things happen like has never, never been seen by modern humanity. Some people talk about uh, uh, Wormwood, uh, Nibiru, Planet X, the, that lost planet. You know, you, you're going to hear this called a lot of things. If this is new to you, get on the uh, Internet and just Google uh, Wormwood or Planet X or Nibiru and see what you can find out about that. <clears throat> because these are things that's going to happen that are very similar, I think, to what happened during the days of Noah. This is what happened, in my opinion, was that same body, that same group of planetary whatever came through our inner solar system and caused all kinds of problems and, and etc. If you remember, and I've wondered about this myself many times, in the book of Revelation, we hear, and there'll be signs in the sky. Signs in the sky. I'm like, what? What's a sign in the sky? Well, what if it was uh, this asteroid that we can see coming for days, weeks, maybe even months, maybe a year or so? We can see this thing coming. And as it gets closer, we're, some are saying, we'll be able to see it with our bare naked eyes. What if people are seeing an asteroid heading toward the earth? And, and they know it's coming, and uh, NASA has tried to lie to us about it and tell us it's not going to strike the earth, but we watch it get closer and closer. What if that sign in the sky is, is what we're talking about here? I, I'm wondering about that because the Bible says in those days it's going to be so fearful and ter terrifying that people's hearts will literally stop for fear. Now, what's God doing with all this? Now, if you remember... Old man Jonah. That's Old Testament stuff. Jonah was told to go uh, and preach to the people in Nineveh. And God said, go down there to Nineveh, preach to those people. Tell them that they're, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to send, I'm going to tear them up. We're, we're gonna, they're gonna, not going to be any Ninevites left unless they repent. And Jonah went down there and preached. And you know what happened? They repented. And what did God do? He kept his word. He did not destroy them. What if, my dear friends, God is sending a COVID-19 virus on planet Earth. And it's dragging out. It's lasting now months. And some are saying it'll take another year or so or more before this to pass through. What if God is giving the planet Earth a Nineveh experience? What if the COVID is a Jonah? And it's sent here to tell us that God is going to destroy us if we don't repent. My dear friends... I, I, if that's the case, we need to get on our faces and we need to get repent and pray that God saves our country and our world. Okay, now, I've been around the bush and we've not answered the question of who the two witnesses are. I think you figured out what, what I think they are. Um, 
but it would be real fun for me. I mean, I would love it if the two witnesses were institutional. Because that means me and you, if we're still living then, we would get to participate in that those events. And we'd get to call fire down from heaven. We'd get to have another Pentecost experience. Oh, I think that'd be so cool. And we'd get to be here when Jesus comes back and raptures his church. Well, I, I don't know how this is going to be, but that's what I think. I believe it's, it's going to be these two men. I, I wish it were going to be institutional, but I think it's going to be literal. Two men, Old Testament men, who are brought back to life. Now, folks, I can't wait for Jesus to be Lord of the earth. I would love it for him to come and solve the political problems of our planet to help us settle uh, the, the big debate about who's going to be president of the United States. I, I, I can't wait for the Lord to come back and take control of the planet Earth, and he's going to do that. He will. And for me, I'm like the old Apostle John. It can't be too quick. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, if you're going to be with me next week, we're going to look at uh, the beast in Revelation 13. The beast. Oh, my. What an interesting thing this will be. Well, thanks for sitting out here with me in my greenhouse. I'm about to freeze to death. Uh, it's out here, but uh, we, it's been fun, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed being out here. may do this again. Uh, we, it's a little colder here, as I said, in southwest Missouri. We had a little snow last night. didn't stick, but it's, it's down there getting kind of cold. It's going to have to get some heat here in, my, here in my greenhouse some of these days soon. But thanks for being with me. Thanks for watching. And I hope you're good. I hope you're handling all the pandemic well. And I know so many of you are tired of, of it, tired of being isolated and tired of being afraid all the time. And, and I, I don't want to tell you, just, just hold on. Don't give up. God's done something. And I can't wait to see what comes out. But God bless you. Thanks for being with me today. See you next time.